works of the Lord, studied by all who have pleasure in them. So honor and majesty are the works of the Lord, who righteousness and goodness forever. Who has caused his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord provides food for the faithful, and is ever mindful of his goodness. The Lord has shown his people the power of his works by giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of the Lord's hands are faithful and just. The precepts of the Lord are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and Christ. The Lord sent redemption to his people and has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and wondrous is God's name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. The praise of the Lord endures forever. And then for our second hymn this morning, number 144. Yeah. 
Pierre and grandson Luke. And Very Luke good. has been helping Paul. So helping Paul. Excellent. Uh, the girls are in Florida this weekend visiting Brad and have a good time. They'll be back Wednesday and then they leave the college on Saturday, maybe Friday, if we can you know, feel like food bugs or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they live in Kansas State on Saturday, so big deal. Oh, yeah. Big deal. All I'd right. like to ask prayers. My dad's having surgery on Tuesday. What's his name? Clyde Bush. Working on the back, it just has the meals so they're going to do uh, some surgery. Hopefully, it will be some pain. So, my parents are prepared. What day is that? Tuesday. Tuesday morning. It's supposed to be an outpatient. Hopefully, they'll be on the phone that day. It just kind of depends on how it all goes. Right. Well, I just wanted to say thank you for the wonderful donation.
praise you that Chelsea gives a good report of, of her trip and uh, with the Zulu people, and we just ask the Lord to continue guidance for her as, as they continue their cross-cultural immersion. Um, Lord, uh, I pray that also that for the revival that they uh, had all night, that uh, Lord, you would bear fruit among the people for their uh, commitment and dedication to to seek you in that manner. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for um, the Christy girls. As they travel, we ask, Lord, to keep them safe, return them back home, and then uh, as they get started at K-State, I pray, Lord, that, that you would help them make good, solid connections and, and, uh, and, uh, and gain a lot from their, their studies there. Lord, we pray for Clyde Bush having surgery and Chuck Young, who's learned that he's dealing with cancer. We just ask that you would uh, touch their bodies and bring healing uh, according to your will and purpose for their lives. Especially, I pray that um, that you would make your presence known uh, among them as they as they deal with these things. Bring your people to their aid as needed, and uh, help us to know how we can serve their. Lord, for this uh, rewards trip, I pray that you would uh, provide the financial needs that are there. And I ask, Lord, that you would also uh, make use of that, that experience in each one of those young lives. Um, not just that they would remember it, but they would see the world is much bigger than they. That they would know that it is more complicated than any man could create that there must be a creator and we give you praise and thanksgiving for the world that you created and just sang about. This is your world, Father, and you created every living thing, every uh, plant and every animal. And, uh, and Lord, each day we wake up and we see the sun come up and many days we take that for granted, but we thank you for that today. And uh, we thank you for the clouds and the rain that provide life for us to enjoy. Lord, we pray for the teachers and the students who are getting ready to go back to school. We ask the Lord for guidance for them, protection for them. And uh, Lord, I pray that you will help them to have a good school year of learning and development. And now, uh, we will bow uh, to remember the words of our Lord when He taught us how to pray to our Father who art in heaven. And hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'll be reading um, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Uh, from the New International Version, and that's it's embedded into my sermon, so um, I will begin uh, with the sermon at this point. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Everyone is influenced by something. If it weren't true, there wouldn't be things such as commercial ad advertisement. Magazines and TV ads and junk mail and billboards 
website ads, irritating aren't they? <laughs> All of these are designed to influence us to feel or think a certain way about a product or service. Some of these ads have the ability to actually deceive us into making decisions that aren't necessarily beneficial to us. Then there's the term DUI. I think we're all pretty familiar with that term, DUI. Everybody knows what that means. It describes a different kind of influence, the kind that prevents us from conducting ourselves carefully. It can influence us to hurt people that we love and even ourselves. And then every parent, every good parent, tries to influence their children to make good choices. <laughs> as much as some of us want to believe otherwise, we are all under the influence of something, some kind of thing or another. The question of the day is, who or what kind of influence will I submit myself to? We are all under an influence of some kind or another. All of us. The question is, who or what kind of influence will I submit myself to? Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 15, says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be very careful then how you live. Live wisely. Discern mentally. Consider accurately or circumspectly. Having done so, order your behavior according to that wisdom that you receive. In your walking around life, don't just give in to what influences come your way. Conduct yourself in such a way that worldly or even demonic influences that target you and your family hit some kind of a barrier before they penetrate your heart or manipulate your mind. I'm a former military guy, and so I, there's, this, there's an illustration um, that I learned in the Army or experienced in the Army that, that, um, that helps illustrate this idea. When there's something worth protecting, or even when it's as, uh, as small as a, a little tent, a command post, we were influenced by our commander to set up a simple perimeter defense. Even the most rudimentary, rudimentary defenses included every asset that we could bring to bear to defend that piece of ground or that command post as effectively as possible. To protect ourselves, we've done foxholes, prepared any vehicle weaponry we had available to us. We'd set up mines or other heavier weapons we might have and utilize camouflage as best we could. Now all this needed to be done in a timely manner as we were instructed that the enemy doesn't always wait for us to set up our defenses in order before they start attacking. Not that we knew that we had, say, 30 minutes before an attack, but, but that there was a window of opportunity available to us. And um, we needed to take advantage of that window of opportunity when it arrived. However, the most effective defensive tool available to us was uh, what was called a crossfire defense. We would set up our foxholes in a circular perimeter in such a manner that the, the, the viewpoint that each foxhole had intersected with another one adjacent to it. So um, there was this, we could see from both sides, so if somebody 
uh, an enemy was attacking and they would hide behind a rock or a tree or something and couldn't be seen from this point of view, they could be seen from this point of view and, and so forth. So the place could be defended. Now, having uh, clear visibility is crucial, it's critical. If there's any brush that needed cut down or terrain features that or rocks or whatever, we needed to modify our defense to be sure that we had clear visibility as much as possible, uh, as much as possible around the entire perimeter. Then the most important piece of this puzzle was that whoever the leaders are walked circumspectly, they inspected all the way around the perimeter, inspecting every aspect of our defensive structure, um, eliminating or shoring up any weak links. For if any one of those weak links were to give, the entire structure would fall, and the enemy would penetrate the perimeter and the battle would be lost. In the same manner, we must be constantly, carefully considering, therefore, how accurately we are conducting ourselves, ordering our behavior, preparing ourselves, ourselves for attack, our family, preparing our family for attack, that our conduct is... Uh, to make sure that our conduct is accurate with respect to the demands of the Word of God. Wisdom tells us that in regard to the spiritual life, to make the best use of every opportunity, time is precious. But it is not important, but it is important to realize that as we talk about time here, we're not talking about chronos time. Chronos meaning watch time or you know, calendar time, or day, or night, or, or minute, or hour time. But we're talking about kairos time. And the difference is that um, kairos time is a window of opportunity. It's the idea it, it, not to make the best use of time as, as such, but of the opportunities that present themselves. We have a strategic, opportune season of time in which to do our good work here on this earth. We, were, we will not live forever. And even then, Christ will not wait forever. There is only a moment. I read a book one time that said, one thing that you cannot do in heaven. And it was about sharing the gospel can't share the gospel in heaven. It's too late then, you know. And so we have an opportune time even now. Um, let's try I got off script. Now most of us have heard the translated phrase, redeeming the time for the days are evil. That's verse 16 uh, in the King James. Evil is not abstract. Um, here, but it's, it's in terms of anything that keeps us busy or distracted, distracts us from doing the good things that we are called to do. Well, this kind of evil is not theoretical. Theoretical, it's also not this uh, in-your-face kind of evil. You know, this zombie with horns and bad breath coming inside your personal bubble. It's 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 not this thing that you can touch or feel. It's this is this kind of of evil is is the worst kind of evil. It's deceptive. It's tricky. It's the kind that, that described here is that is that which is subtle, a, a subtle interruption of you being faithful, subtle interruption of you being consistent in your walk with Christ, subtle. Um, in just being the, the man or woman of God that you were called to be. Have you ever um, asked somebody, how's it going? And the response is, oh, I'm just taking it as it comes. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. That response may be a figure of speech, but if that is an accurate description of a person's approach to life, they are what this uh, verse 17 describes as foolish or an unwise person. This response is the exact representation of unintelligence 
in its purest form. The instruction here then is to stop becoming people who live without reflection or the use of intelligence. Paul is, is forbidding his readers from continuing to have unintelligent, uh, to behave unintelligently. He's putting an end to something that the church is doing in Ephesus. He's putting into the church, an end to the church's senseless behavior that is occurring without the use of forethought or reason. Paul's saying, people, we've got to think before we act. We've got to study the Word and, and live according to it. We can't just let things come to us and respond. Scientists say that the one thing that separates humans from the animals is that we as humans have the ability to what? To reason. To reason, right? And yet it's a sad commentary on our world today that so many fail to rise above an animal animalistic uh, existence. We often don't use reason or even listen to it. A lot of us don't listen to reason, do we? So Paul explains that we need to use our ability to think and reflect and reason in order to gain a sound understanding of what the Lord's will is in this window of opportunity. And we, in fact, have an advantage over the apostle writing the epistle. What advantage is that? The advantage we have is we have the entire book. He only had the Old Testament to go off of. And the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, of course, but, but we have the whole thing. We need to make use of it. In verse 18, um, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's less concern about the word wine in the Greek. Uh, less concern about the wine, it's the drink itself, than the actual becoming drunk with it. Becoming drunk means to be literally soaked with wine. That's what Paul's saying. There's a classical Greek writer named Homer who wrote about the, the soaking of a bull, bull hide uh, in, a, in fat in order to make that hide more elastic so it would stretch. I don't know if he was using it for a drum or, or what, but... Um, he was talking about soaking that bull hide with fat in order to make it more elastic. It's the same effect when we are soaked with wine. If you can think about it with me. We become more elastic and we can be stretched beyond what our sober limits might be into areas of activity that we wouldn't normally participate. Our inhibitions are, are dropped and we begin to do things that we wouldn't normally do. And so it's this idea of becoming drunk with wine or soak, soaked or saturated with wine is what Paul is instructing us against. Our world today thinks that debauchery, says the, the verse says it leads to being drunk, leads to debauchery. Our world thinks that debauchery is a synonym for fun. It does. However, the word translated debauchery in verse 18 comes from the root word meaning to save, which is interesting. The problem with that is that this particular word means, means the exact opposite. It has that alpha primitive or whatever they call that thing. The A before the word. Um, anyway, that means the exact opposite. So the problem with that word is it being soaked with wine leads to unsavingness. Debauchery meaning in the root to save, but the opposite of it. So being soaked with wine leads to saving, unsavingness. There's not a single saving quality about drunkenness about being saturated with wine. It is a destructive quality. It is the abandoning of life rather than the saving of it. 
drunkenness then is, in essence, spiritual suicide. And then Paul says, instead, he gives us the alternative, right? Be filled with the Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit of God? We touched on this topic a few weeks ago. Well, let's take another stab at it here today. It means a liberal supply, more than what's needed, a flood of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 6, verse 15, we have Stephen, a man filled with faith and the Holy Spirit. Faith filled Stephen in the sense that it controlled or influenced him. The Holy Spirit filled Stephen in the sense that he influenced Stephen. Therefore, the fullness of the Spirit has reference to his influence over the believer who is submitted to him. Be constantly being filled with the Spirit. Notice, uh, this is literally the way it reads in the Greek. Be constantly being filled with the Spirit. It's a, it's a regular activity. It's a constant activity, a daily thing, a moment by moment, constant filling. But notice in this, in, in this uh, character of it, it's in the passive voice. Be filled. It's somebody else is doing the filling. And yet... There's some sense of the, this that, that we have some responsibility in being filled. Because it's also a command, right? Rather, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, we have this responsibility in being filled, and yet we are not the ones who do the filling. Interesting. God will not fill us with His Spirit against our will. It requires our submission. And... Therefore, if you will, God is the faucet. The Spirit is the water. And we are the hand that moves the glass under the spout to be filled. We are also the mouth that drinks its goodness. So be constantly, moment by moment, being influenced by the Spirit. In closing, I'd like to call your attention to the fact that every great revival in history, in this dealing with those last couple of verses. Every major revival in history, every significant historical move of the Holy Spirit among God's people, written down in history, uh, there's a gazillion books about different revivals in different places. Each one of those is marked by new worship music being written. Fascinating. In each case, the musical stylings of the day, whether they were organ or piano or fiddle or guitar or banjo or whatever was used in the tavern, was that, that music was put to biblical words, Christian doctrine and inspirational uh, truth. And, uh, and they began to sing them in their times of worship. They taught them to the people. Just about every one of these hymns were written that way in those kinds of uh, times of renewal, spiritual outpouring. So, that may be something of what Paul is explaining to the Ephesian church here when he's talking to them or encouraging them to speak to one another in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. Maybe sometimes the words that we use uh, certainly wouldn't be the kinds of words that we use in anger or frustration or judgment, but they would be compassionate words of love and, and uh, encouragement. The Spirit of God is moving in this generation. And I want to encourage you, as He influences you, so also influence those around you. Where the Spirit of God moves, He speaks through believer to believer. I'm not asking, I'm not suggesting even, 
that we need to write a bunch of new worship music. Okay, that's not, that's not where I'm going with this. But we can. What we learn from here, we can share, can't we? Um, what we're inspired to do, we can ask for prayer about. Where the Spirit of God moves, He speaks through, through believer to believer. He speaks grace and peace and love to us. Give testimony to God's grace in, in your life, to those around you. And bear witness to the peace that you have received in Christ.
peace with love and faith. And grace be with us forever.